Good afternoon and welcome to the second half of today's uh, portion of the conference, Lying in Politics, What is the Fate of Politics in the Age of Lying, Advertising, and Mass Market Deception? As we move into um, this portion of the event, I'd like to first uh, do something I forgot to do in the morning, which was to thank the Bard Graduate Center for this lovely space. And um, secondly, to urge you to um, put on silent your, um, your cell phones uh, and other uh, electronic devices. It really is my great pleasure to, um, to introduce, people are still drifting in a little bit, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Kirsty McClure. She's a scholar, in her own words, of no particular discipline. Uh, <laughs> which I thought was a very great way to put it. <laughs> uh, but more accurately, it might be that she has no one discipline. Uh, <laughs> As Associate Professor of Political Science and Comparative Literature at UCLA, um, I should also add that while she was at Princeton, she put in time with the historians, including one of my, my mentors, um, Lauren Stone, the redoubtable Lauren Stone. She is also doing the heroic work as the lone theory editor in the, uh, for the American Political Science Review. And today she's going to talk to us on the subject of nobody's facts, and that follows in a long line of truly wonderful titles, um, less creatively feminist interpretations of John Locke, that was but more words. Okay. <laughs> but otherwise, between the castigation of texts and the excess of words, figuring authority, statistical science, liberal narrative, and the vanishing subject, speaking in tenses, narrative politics and historical writing, the odor of judgment, <laughs> exemplarity. <laughs> Propriety and politics in the company of Hannah Arendt. Um, so it is my great pleasure to welcome this distinguished speaker uh, who will speak to us again on Nobody's Facts. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to uh, uh, Roger Berkowitz and to Dick Bernstein for their kind invitation and to all of those um, very familiar and also unfamiliar faces in the audience, um, all of whom I hope to be able to talk to uh, later so that I will understand what it is I'm doing. <laughs> um, I'm not going to waste uh, much time, um, but I have to say I'm not someone who you can expect to make the trains run on time anyway. Um, but I will waste half a second to give you very brief. Um, it's not an explanation and it's not an account, but it is perhaps nonetheless a little bit less than a confession. At the point when Roger uh, contacted me about this conference, um, I was immediately enthusiastic, um, partly because I always love uh, coming to New York and uh, have always loved doing anything having to do with the new school, um, which I think is one of the greatest institutions in America for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I was also um, uh, burdened by a very uh, affective, um, deeply um, affective re response to the Gulf oil, quote, quote, spill. Uh, I think a spill is what you do with milk on a table. Uh, and so when he asked me if I would do this, uh, and he said it was about lying in politics, and we were hearing all kinds of things on the, on the radio and television, and, uh, I immediately said, yes, of course I will. I have no idea what I'll do, but, but I will. So when he asked me for a title, um, Nobody's Facts is the best I could come up with because I didn't really, uh, well, I don't want to give you the impression that I know what I'm talking about yet. But, uh, <laughs> but I have kind of honed in our problem. Uh, and so if I had given him a subtitle at that point, it would have been something like Nobody's Facts, colon, Organization and the Structural Lie. Um, I have a rather uh, longer manuscript than I will have time to read here, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read more of the uh, historiographical materials at the beginning, and um, some of the materials uh, of our very contemporary world um, I'm going to be much more brief with because you're going to actually know a heck of a lot more about it 
um, uh, not only than I have written, but know about it in many respects uh, more than I do. Uh, okay. Nobody's facts. Homer sang of a clever man with two good eyes, a handful of companions, and a quick tongue. A man who told an inquisitive cyclops that his name was Eutus. Nobody. Odysseus' deception came full circle as Stanhope stands the later as Polyphemus, bloody and blinded, raged wildly in pursuit of his erstwhile captives. Others of his kind, aroused by uh, the din of his cries, asked who it was that had injured him so. Nobody, he replied. Nobody did this to me. We never really hear his comrades respond, but it's easy enough to feel initially the palpable shrug of their shoulders. Nobody. Homer's story of Odysseus' strategic lie is a rich poetic instance of Hannah Arendt's well-known observation about the discomforting if contingent proximity of lying in politics. And if it is difficult to sympathize with Polyphemus, it's not at all hard to regard the incident as a fair, high political specimen, not only of Arendt's point, but also of what Martin Jay has recently called the virtues of mendacity. Odysseus lied to save himself and his companions, and even at that, they barely escaped with their skins intact. Familiar though this sort of lie may be, in speaking today of nobody's facts, this is not the sort of thing I have in mind. Taking Arendt as his touchstone, I'm interested in a considerably more modern nobody. This is not Odysseus Utis, who, after all, knows his own name and lies strategically to deceive an enemy. Rather, what I have in mind is another, more shadowy figure who Arendt sporadically invokes, that cipher of impersonality that appears when she speaks of bureaucracy as the rule of nobody. Simply, and perhaps too simply put, my question is this. Is it possible to have a lie without a liar? The problem on its face would seem to be a non-starter. Insofar as a lie requires an intention to deceive, surely it requires an agent of deception. This was certainly so on Arendt's view, even if that agent might itself be self-deceived, as she thought the case for the new forms of lying made visible in the Pentagon Papers. That is, the sorts of lying typical, on the one hand, of public relations in the hands of ad men devoted to image making, and, on the other hand, of scientific theories in the hands of rational problem solvers, enchanted by what she called a pseudo-mathematical language that took non-facts as reality. Indeed, in, case of, in the case of the decades-long story of American involvement in Vietnam, she explicitly rejected the evils of bureaucracy as sufficient to explain the pervasive defactualization that she regarded as the best guarded secret revealed by the Pentagon Papers. What was most striking on her view was the chasm the papers revealed between decision makers' insulation from reality on the one hand, and the factual accuracy maintained by the intelligence services and reported daily by the press on the other. In what follows, I want to return to uh, a number of Arendt's categories for a perspective then that she never pursued, but one that I think is capable of development in the service of sketching a phenomenon that I will call the structural lie as a persistent risk in a world grown accustomed to bureaucratic administration. In so doing, I want to shift the field of vision, so to speak, from the conventional emphasis on the personal responsibility or political accountability of liars to the potential consequences of factual inaccuracies generated within large-scale organizations, both public and private, that enjoy public trust. Nobody's facts thus refers to errors or mistakes rather than intentional deception. The product of inadvertency rather than intention, they nonetheless fall under the barest of bare bones renderings of Swift's characterization of the lie as a matter simply of saying the thing that is not. In effect, we might say, they are not facts taken as facts in the or ordinary course of organizational operations that presume their particular truths as accurate reports of what is the case. In view of our common topic here of lying and politics, rather than lying in politics, essentially what I'm doing is I'm shifting the question to 
the administration side of the presumptive distinction between politics and administration. So in view of that common topic, the burden of my admittedly peculiar fit formulation is twofold. <clears throat> On the one hand, my task is to provide a plausible sketch of the existence of the structural lie as a worldly phenomenon. On the other hand, and in concluding, it will be to draw to try to draw out some of its significance for politics, which I'm trusting that some of you are going to be able to help me with, because I'm not at all clear on the question. Um, there will be basically uh, three parts. The first two uh, uh, I'm basically going to read. The first one is a preliminary consideration of what I'm calling the Arentian world. The second, um, there are a couple of examples from military history. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, the third are some more contemporary examples, which, as I say, I'm going to rush through very quickly, and then perhaps, a if not closing reflections, maybe a couple closing questions. So first of all, some preliminary considerations on the Arentian world. Let me begin by drawing attention to what uh, Arendt called the world, uh, and which Shayla ben reminded us of uh, during the last uh, uh, discussion before lunch. Uh, this is something that more particularly she phrased in the human condition, as the thing character of the world. Included here, of course, is the built environment, the materiality of cities and towns, of public buildings, of private dwellings, places of business, museums, roads, churches, and the like, as well as the infrastructures of transportation, energy, communications, and finance, to name just a few, uh, that are familiar aspects of that world, that thing character of that world in our time. Importantly, however, the thing character of a rent's world also includes what might be called elemental facts of human communication and memory. The documents, archives, or memoirs that report the factual truths that, on her view, by, veer, by, by virtue of their sheer particularity, were far more fragile than the rational truths of human intellect. Themselves the material record of action, speech, and thought these factual truths are the reified forms of deeds and facts and events and patterns of thoughts or ideas. Initially seen, heard, and remembered firsthand, such matters achieve a measure of durability by being transformed, she says, into things. Thus, as she put it, the whole factual world of human affairs depends for its reality and its continued existence first, upon the presence of others who have seen and heard and will remember, and second, on the transformation of the intangible into the tangibility of things. In this respect, the otherwise, other, the otherwise unworldly character of thought, speech, and act, action depends, Arendt says, for its reality and materialization on the same workmanship that builds the other things of the human artifice." End quote. In sum, whatever one may think of Arendt's distinction between animal labyrinths, homo favor, and the man of action, in its most durable sense, the whole factual world of human affairs owes its worldliness to homo favor, to man the maker, as the recorder and scribe of its multifaceted existence. It is to this aspect of the world that Arendt describes both the potency of the traditional lie and the common characteristic of the liar and the man of action. Both act into the, dis the disturbing contingency of all factual reality, and both in their doings confirm human freedom. In this respect, the liar, she argues, is an actor by nature. He says what is not so because he wants things to be different from what they are. That is, he wants to change the world. Albeit in different ways, both the liar and the man of action can do violence to the world as it is or has been. The liar by saying that which is not as if it were. The man of action by bringing something new into the world that may either augment or destroy the existing fabric of the factual reality into which he acts. Arendt's own concerns across various works touching on this topic um, not only the human condition, of course, but life and politics, truth and politics, thinking and moral considerations. Um, it arises, this concern is a, a, is a, if you want to do a thematic reading, there are very few places in Arendt's uh, uh, substantial corpus where you don't find some echo of it. 
But across that whole corpus, her concerns were not, however, with the traditional liar. Rather, they were with the new forms of deception and self-deception that she discerned on the one hand in the totalitarian falsification of the historical record, the disappearance of Trotsky, of course, from Stalin's uh, short history of the uh, famous part of the USSR. Um, and on the other hand, in the activities of image makers, admin, and social scientific problem solvers, whose fabrications insulated successive administ American administrations from the realities of Southeast Asia. And again, as I noted in passing, she rejected bureaucratic explanations for the disaster that became the Vietnam War. All that said, Arendt also abjured as well the moralism that usually attends consideration of lying and politics. What made that possible, I would submit, was her persistent concern for the thing character of the world as constitutive of what she called the reality and continued existence of the whole factual world of human affairs. It is this on her view that enables, and I'm quoting, the category of truth versus falsehood to number among the mental means by which we take our bearings in the world. In so doing, that category of truth versus falsehood that rests on these elemental facts provides a ground and limit for the ever-changing realm of opinion. In sum, insofar as action depends upon this capacity for taking our bearings, so too does it depend upon what I've referred to here as the elemental facts of communication inscribed in documents and records that give tangible form to that which is and has been. The question then is what this has to do with the administrative operations of large-scale organizations uh, and the public form that those are typically called bureaucracies. Bureaucracy has become a generic term, uh, but for the most part I would say the private form uh, could just as easily be called corporate administration uh, to at least attempt to preserve the distinction between public and private. As some things are seen more easily at a distance, let me turn to a few historical examples to differentiate the kinds of simple errors or mistakes that are inevitable in all large-scale organizations from the phenomenon I'm calling the structural lie. This is this little bit of military history that I'm sure you'd like to enjoy. In so doing, my hope is to elaborate some preliminary distinction, one or two, that might carry through into attention to more recent events and experiences and a closing question about their uh, relationship to, to politics. The title of my first section, uh, uh, sorry, second section, uh, is Blunder, Military Machine, Snafu, the organizations of the world, past and present, may be numberless, but in any historical accounting, the military would surely count among those of, long, of longest standing. It is, then, in military history that resources for distinguishing between simple errors or mistakes and structural lies might most easily be found. Not coincidentally, it is also in the military, as an early adopter and beneficiary of industrial organization, that we might discern something of the hopes and dilemmas attending large-scale organizations as matters of public purpose and concern. Beyond this, however, it is also in the military that we can glimpse the dependence of public hopes and dilemmas on the elemental facts of documents and records that give tangible form to what is seen and said and done, what is reported as information, what is sent as instructions or commanded as orders, by distant others. I set aside here as beyond my scope large-scale military disasters of strategy, tactics, and planning on the part of military or political leadership in favor of matters far more mundane. Consider first the case of a simple error, a blunder in communication, that resulted in the legendary charge of the Light Brigade in the Battle of Balaclava, an early engagement of the Crimean War. It camped at the northwestern end of the Balaclava Valley in late October 1854. The allied British, French, and Turkish forces anticipated an imminent Russian attack. The valley was rimmed on the north by the hills of, of the Fedakin Heights, which were studded by Russian artillery emplacements. Dividing the northern from the southern reaches of the valley uh, was a narrow ridge called Causeway Heights, which hosted Turkish artillery and a detail of British infantry. The open eastern end of the valley was the site of further Russian artillery behind which 
the bulk of the Russian art uh, cavalry was uh, gathered. The initial combat of the, ba of the battle uh, uh, took the form of Russian attack on the defending Turkish artillery. It was in response to the possibility that the Russians were making off with those guns that the British commander, one Lord Raglan, with a prime hilltop view of the whole scene, issued the fateful order, which read as follows. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy from carrying away the guns. Troop of horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. Immediate. It wasn't even email, and that's what it sounded like. <laughs> that order was conveyed to the senior cavalry officer down in the valley, one Lord Lucan who lacked the advantage of Raglan's high promontory on the plateau above the valley. Accounts differ as to how or why it happened, but the written order, written and signed by Raglan's quartermaster general, was entrusted to his aide, one Captain Louis Nolan. On receiving the order, Lucan pressed Nolan for specifics as to what guns it was referring to. To Lucan's questioning, Nolan is reported to have, have replied, uh, making a sweeping gesture down the valley. There, my lord, is our enemy, and there are our guns. But his gesture was not toward the imperiled guns on the Causeway Heights, but rather toward the far end of the valley where the Russian artillery and cavalry were massed. And that was the order that Lukan gave the commander of the Light Brigade. The rest, as they say, is history. Over 600 cavalry participated in the charge, less than 200 returned mounted. According to an account published soon after in London, 156 were either killed or missing, 122 wounded, and unknown numbers, even a year later, taken prisoner. 335 horses were either killed in action or destroyed later on account of their wounds. The, effect was given, the event was given shape in poetry as well, in the memorable lines from Tennyson. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldiers knew, someone had blundered. Regardless of where the responsibility for the blunder is laid, on Raglan for is issuing vague orders, on Nolan for inexplicably garbling the message, on Lucan for his zealously immediate obedience to orders that he must have known made no sense. The disaster that befell the light brigade suggests the principal feature of the simple error or mistake for a large-scale organization in action. Its consequences follow swiftly in the order of time. The simple mistake does not linger, as it were, in the records or the archives to reveal its consequences down the line at a later date when somebody relies upon it for something. To the contrary, those consequences follow closely on its heels. The inadvertent hole it tears in factual reality is evident in its immediate effects. As Arendt noted in a different context, reality takes its revenge on those who dare to defy it. But, I would add, that revenge also visits those whose defiance is unintended, perhaps even those whose defiance is discernible only after the fact when the dust has settled. Considered broadly the mistake that sent the Light Brigade to its doom numbers among what Clausewitz famously called the frictions of war. These are the endless particularities originating in chance that render general theories of war hazardous guides if they are not closely attuned to the experience of combat. With that in mind, let me leave the simple mistake behind and head toward the structural lie by turning to a pair of additional examples. One of these is drawn from the cusp of the 20th century, its contrast from a bit of military jargon that became broadly colloquial during the Second World War for soldiers and civilians alike. I must say, uh, as someone who works in the University of California system, uh, we're thinking of uh, adding it as part of an acronym to, uh, to UCLA. <laughs> you can see the crossword puzzle where UCLA goes this way and you could get snafu in either, either two places. You could actually get snafu there <laughs> twice. <laughs> 42 years after the Battle of Balaclava, we have a remarkable first-person account of another British military campaign, this time in North Africa. Initially penned in 1898, Winston Churchill's The River War 
recounts the British and Egyptian reconquest of Sudan in terms that blend rich descriptions of occasional frictions of war with criticisms of British commanders, even as it expresses glowing admiration for the modern machinery of war, both technological and organizational. Historiographically speaking, Churchill's admiration for the supporting structures of the military machine is perhaps the most striking aspect of the book. Not simply in its prose, which is striking enough, Churchill actually is quite a writer when he wants to be, but even more so in the character of narrative hero that it accords to the powers of organization. This heroic part is played by the combined organizational efforts of the commissariat, that is the supply corps, and the railway staff, which together built and supplied a long desert railway that eventually delivered gunboats and munitions, as well as troops, camels, and supplies, to the staging point at Barra, from which the final approach to the Khalifa's capital in Khartoum was begun. Essentially, they built hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of railroad through an essentially waterless desert in order to surprise the Khalifa in Khartoum by managing to move a huge amount of men and material and machinery without recourse to the lower part, or I should say upper part, of the White Nile uh, areas that the Khalifa uh, patrolled. Churchill's pithy remarks in his chapter on the Desert Railway will be sufficient, I hope, to convey the point. There he observes that the conventional accolades of warfare are typically, quote, bestowed on those whose offices are splendid and whose duties have been dramatic. Tales of war, of war regale the reader with scenes of fighting. The eye is fixed, he says, on the troops as they move amid the smoke, on the swarming figures of the enemy, and on the calm determination of the general in the middle of his staff. Other aspects of war, he says, both men and things, go unnoticed. But here, he suggests, is where matters vital to, military, to modern military success are nonetheless visible to those who care to look. Among these are, quote, the long trailing line of communications, the thousand miles of rail, road, and river with their convoys crawling to the front in uninterrupted succession. Churchill captures the effect of all this in a startling metaphor. Victory, he says, is the beautiful, bright-colored flower. Transport is the stem without which it could never have blossomed. Fighting the river war was thus primarily a matter of transport. The Khalifa, he says, was conquered on the railway. Churchill strikes the same mechanico-heroic note again, and more fulsomely, at the end of the same chapter. With the completion of the desert railway across these vast stretches of desert, he concludes that, though the battle was not yet fought, victory was won. With that long ribbon of rail established, and this is a long quote because it really gives you a sense of what he's what he's uh, doing in, in this admiration for the military machine. With the rail established, it had become possible with convenience and speed to send into the heart of the Sudan great armies independent of the season of the year and the resources of the country, to supply them not only with abundant food and ammunition, but with all the varied paraphernalia of scientific war, and to support their action on land by a powerful flotilla of gunboats which could dominate the river and command the banks and could, at any moment, make their way well past Khartoum itself. In sum, the Khalifa, his capital, and his army were now within Kitchener's reach. He continues, it remained only to pluck the fruit in the most convenient hour with the least trouble and the smallest cost. To be sure, the railway was not without its frictions, cholera, and the scarcity of skilled labor among them. But for Churchill, the brilliance of the project shone forth in the calculations of a young French officer and engineer, who along with his staff laid out with uncanny accuracy both the plan itself and its human and material requirements at each step of the way. In battle itself, frictions were doubtless inevitable, but in the planning and administration of supply, transport, and communications, modern administrative organization laid the groundwork for an unprecedented success. Churchill's glowing praise for the administrative machinery of planning and supply, of course, 
was a historiographical representation of the elementary facts as he saw them. It is, in a sense, a narrative analog to the pictures of and pay-ins to smart bombs in media coverage of the first Gulf War, driven by a fascination with the powers of technique, technology, and science. Both were largely silent on the downsides of the things they admired. To tap into this, let me fast forward briefly to 1941 and a linguistic innovation variously attributed to American soldiers or to British troops. I'm referring to a bit of military jargon, the term snafu, the precise origin of which is less important than the sentiment and experience it conveys and the broad colloquial uptake it has enjoys in the seven decades or so that have passed since its initial coinage. If, as I've suggested, the military can plausibly be regarded as a perduring example of large-scale organization, it should not be surprising that a bottom-up <coughs> perspective on the downside of such organizations might find colorful expression there. Regardless of its specific national provenance, it is in a snafu that I think we can begin to glimpse something of the phenomenon I'm calling the structural lie. Rendered politely, the term is an acronym for situation normal, all foul up. <laughs> the snafu in military parlance goes well beyond the singular and immediate occurrence of a simple mistake, for it taps the experience of a situation in which normal, that is, by the book, expectations of organizational performance are undone by unanticipated failures at the level of the system itself. In effect, to stick with Churchill's military imagery, we might say that snafu is a figure of speech for a situation in which the well-oiled machines of transportation, communications, or supply, perhaps even a combination of these, turn out to have accumulated sand in their gears at some <coughs> point vital to their combined or sequential functioning according to plan or design. <coughs> Recall for a moment Arendt's account of the thing character of the world and the significance she ascribes to such simple facts as documents and records. The kind of snap that <coughs> interests me here would be one that rests in a broad sense on a failure of standard operating procedures and routine expectations. Indeed, the failure of routine expectations of the most minimal sorts of accuracy for the, for the, I'm sorry, for the operational purposes of the organization. This might result, perhaps, from the conveyance of mistaken information from one point in an organization to another, where it is taken as accurate and acted on by its addressees. Or it might stem from errors in data entry for some early stage of an organizational project or process on which later stages depend for their success. The possibilities, while that was not infinite, are nonetheless as extensive as the kinds of organizational tasks and the varieties of procedures through which they're pursued by the wide range of large-scale organizations that populate contemporary social, economic, and political life. This, I think, is where the phenomenon I'm calling the structural lie finds its footing in the world. As my purpose here is to be suggestive rather than exhaustive, let me try to flesh this out a bit further um, by leaving the military behind in favor of more contemporary uh, concerns. Uh, in the next section, I'll make recourse uh, briefly to an academic literature in, something in which something very like the structural why goes by another name. And following that, I'll turn to a few events and experiences of recent memory that might bring the point closer to home. These latter may or may not in the long run prove viable candidates for redescription as consequences of structural lies. But for now, various of their characteristics strike me as approximation, reasonable approximations of that possibility. Um, if this lecture were a book, these might be separate chapters, each with case studies, um, and replete with lots of facts. But since I don't want to uh, generate structural lies myself, uh, I'm just going to be very brief here. And in some cases, I'll simply refer to uh, people who, uh, to, to the, the, the current factual record. Um, my, uh, my third section then uh, is titled Paper Work, uh, colon, the obligatory short phrasing, colon, long phrasing. Um, the long phrasing is uh, walrus robo-signing derivatives. <laughs> in a much-cited review essay of 1999, a sociologist named Diane Vaughn limbed the theoretical groundwork for what she called the dark side of organizations. 
Aiming to establish this as an integrated field of study for sociology, Vaughan's concern was to draw together a range of disparate literatures uh, in sociology and organizational theory uh, and elsewhere to show how adverse societal consequences as a result of uh, mistake, misconduct, and disaster, end quote, could be brought under the rubric of organization theory by inventing a conceptual container <coughs> adequate for exploring organizations' production of unanticipated suboptimal consequences. <laughs> this is not a cartoon. <laughs> The paper is wide-ranging and complex, and I will not attempt to do justice to it here. Indeed, I probably couldn't. Of particular interest for my purposes, though, is her attention to what she calls routine nonconformity as the, quote, systematic production of organizational deviance. Routine nonconformity is the systematic production of organizational deviance. In routine nonconformity, the adjective routine does not refer to a standard operating procedure or norm. <coughs> Rather, it, rec it refers to the recurring deviations from such standard operating procedures or norms that populate the life of any organization. Um, organizational theory and the sociology of risk and the sociology of organization has largely left Weber well behind. Vaughn carefully defines organizational deviance as, and I'm quoting here, any event, activity, or circumstance occurring in and or produced by a formal organization. Second clause. <laughs> Second clause. That, I'm not making this up, I could. Um, that deviates from both formal design goals and normative standards or expectations. In one of two ways, that's me. Uh, either in the fact of its occurrence or in its consequences and produces a suboptimal outcome. This is a long way from my stylized examples from military history. Um, in, a, in what is obviously a disciplinary language of social science um, that does not aim to communicate to a broader public. It nonetheless suggests much the same point as my attempt to distinguish between the simple error or mistake and the structural lie. While the former is a singular instance, the latter is a wayward element of the system itself. And in this respect could be taken as a form of organizational deviance. That is, what I'm calling the structural lie could be understood as a form of what uh, these uh, organizational sociologists call uh, organizational deviance. To distinguish it further, however, that is to distinguish the structural lie further, um, I might note the part of Vaughan's definition that includes deviations of two kinds, either in the fact of its occurrence or in its consequences. If, like the mistake, the traditional lie uh, departs from an organization's formal goals and normative standards or expectations and can be known either in the fact of its occurrence or in its consequences, I think the structural, uh, I'm sorry, the distinguishing feature of the structural lie is precisely that it is not discernible simply in the fact of its occurrence. That would be the simple mistake. As a non-fact taken as a fact, in the documents and records that give tangible form to the information circulated through organizational communication, it is known, as it were, only after the fact. That is, only when its consequences have become clear. This, I think, is why the military come colloquial notion of snafu is an apt prefiguration of the structural lie. It's non-reality wrought by nobody in particular. It enters the many-handed stream of organizational tasks, procedures, and operations as if it were true. And it is only down the line in another time and another place that its consequences, in Vaughan's language, its unanticipated suboptimal outcomes, point backward in time to make its existence and ultimate implications matters of public knowledge. Without referring to structural lies, uh, of course, since I just made that up, um, Vaughan herself pursued this possibility in the concatenation of scientific dilemmas, corporate misrepresentations, communications and leadership failures, 
and organizational deviations that led to the Challenger disaster of 1986. It is actually quite a stunning book. Here, however, we might consider a few more recent events and experiences, specifically the Gulf oil spill and the financial meltdown, as offering more suitable candidates for the rubric of structural law. Each of these, I think, seems to have arisen, at least in part, from an assortment of impersonal, if sometimes professional, operations within a variety of familiar organizations. My concept at this point is admittedly rough, to say the least, but I've chosen three examples to try to sharpen it further, and I'm looking forward to your help in doing so. The walrus, robo-signing, and derivatives, which I will take up each very, very briefly uh, before concluding. Uh, the most important thing, and I'm going to have to really, really abbreviate here, uh, the most important thing about these organizations is that you can, that is not just if you're an organizational person, but there's a couple of useful categories. You can divide them up into tasks, processes, and structures. Um, tasks are the kinds of things that no matter where you are in the organization, you have your particular tasks that you have to do. Um, this is the way uh, the division of labor is sorted out. Presumably there's some sort of functional relationship between uh, everybody's tasks. That's what the organizational plan or design is about. Um, secondly, there are processes, uh, and this is more like the organization of the workflow. This is how the division of labor is functionally integrated um, to produce whatever it is that the organization produces. Um, in the case of a, a canning factory, perhaps cans full of food. In the case of, a, of an army, uh, violence, warfare. Uh, finally, there are the structures. This is the institutional skeleton uh, within which uh, the tasks and processes are organized and presumably the, 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 by which they are somehow directed. And even those can be of different shapes. They can be very vertical, as is the case in most military organizations, or they can be uh, pretty close to horizontal. They can be flat, as is very much the case, for example, in Apple, in Apple uh, uh, since the beginning. What about the walrus then? Surely you must know who I'm talking about here. It's not a character in a Beatles song. Uh, it is an early character in the news cycle of the Gulf oil spill. Uh, that walrus appeared in BP's oil spill plan. Uh, it was filed with the Federal Mining and Mineral Services. Initially, the walrus looks like a mistake at the task level. Um, Along with sea otters and sea lions, also entities that do not live in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it appeared uh, in a part of the environmental impact uh, section that, this is a document of some 584 pages that is available online. Um, I'd recommend reading um, uh, Churchill first. Um, <laughs> this is tough going. This is tough going. This makes kind of look like child's play. Um, <laughs> In any case, it appears as a species potentially affected by a hypothetically catastrophic oil spill. Oil spill. So all of these uh, companies that are drilling deep sea uh, kinds of uh, uh, operations are required by law to file uh, uh, these applications, both at the exploratory stage and then finally when the wells go into production. Um, and so my first thought was, uh, as everybody was laughing about the walrus that appeared there, well, was this accidental copying from another application that they had turned into the Arctic? So I immediately, like many people in organizational studies, thought, um, probably my, you know, in my own, I, I can't tell you how many mistakes I make in copying things and doing things, and I thought, well, that, that was just probably the error at the task level. Uh, not so. Eventually, it turned out that the walrus's odd appearance in that disaster plan for the Gulf of Mexico arose at the level of processes and structures. The papers filed for the, uh, this is called the Macondo well, that's the name of the location, uh, the Deepwater Horizon is the drilling room. The papers filed for the Deepwater Horizon's permit to drill the well were generic rather than unique to that site. They did not, in other words, reflect the specificity of that site of that drilling rig, of that operation, or of the lay of the land, as it were, underwater, or anything that had anything to do with the fact that it was a virtually unprecedented depth that they were going to be working on. Instead, and this is actually, this is, there's, the five hours of these hearings are actually uh, online, uh, and they're pretty interesting. Uh, the congressional hearings that had the uh, CEOs of some five uh, uh, oil companies to come talk about this uh, in public. Um, 
It turns out that the papers filed repeated a formula apparently specified in part by the Mining and Mineral Services itself, and it was shared by four other companies uh, drilling in within a couple hundred miles of the Deepwater Horizon. And when I say shared, um, I mean not simply that they were not unique to BP. I mean that um, the papers filed by these other companies for other sites um, duplicated almost word for word some 90% or more of the BP papers, including the famous walrus, as well as listing experts who had apparently been dead for years. <laughs> In each company, as it turns out, the write-up was not done by the company itself, but was subcontracted out to a sub-entity um, who apparently thought, you know, good enough for Peter, good enough for Paul. It is difficult, uh, I think, to think of this as anything, for me, anything other than a structural lie that is submitted to public authorities, invested with public trust, um, these papers are routinely filed to be able to uh, make the company answerable to a public that is presumably concerned with what is done with their minerals. Uh, in this case, uh, that public trust was violated, as you all who saw television during the period uh, might have witnessed in any number of ways. And the final report that uh, came across the president's desk, which uh, of some 380 pages itself is now available online at the white, at whitehouse.gov, um, is itself fascinating for how, uh, I almost wish Arendt were alive, because I think that her, her reading of this document and the history that goes back to the 1970s, and James Watt, I don't know who remembers James Watt, uh, a uh, delightful man who invented, uh, who invented the Mining and Mineral Services, uh, the history of how that organization uh, was framed around two tasks that, that, that hit the United States simultaneously during the oil crisis in the early 70s. One of them was uh, making the United States energy independent, and the other one was environmental uh, concerns, because the oil rig off the coast of uh, Santa Barbara had blown in 1969. So these, these, these uh, imperatives uh, converged on the creation of this new entity, uh, structural lie. I think that's a good example. My second example would be robo-signing. The automatic generation of documents, short definition. This too, it turns out, um, happens at the level of tasks and processes. And a lot of this is still involved in litigation. So I'm not going to say anything conclusive here. Uh, as if I could. Um, uh, in any case, uh, the, the robo-signing that I'm talking about is uh, uh, the automatic generation of documents about mortgage arrears and foreclosure documents. Once upon a time, this too has a history. These things come into being um, not out of some kind of ill will or deception on the part of the sort of street level uh, folks in these organizations. They all have histories and the histories have to do with organizational imperatives in times of uh, under time, sometimes under great pressure. Once upon a time, mortgages uh, were held by a local bank, uh, and that mortgage was organized by face-to-face -face contact with the borrower. Um, uh, it was certainly the case for my parents, and it was the case for their parents. It was even the case for my first mortgage in Baltimore in the 1990s. Um, this is no longer the case. Now, there is a multiply layered market for the sale of mortgages and mortgage services. And a mortgage may be bought and sold numerous times over the life of the loan. And indeed, often for the first month or two of the loan, it changes hands 10, even 20 times, depending on market conditions. The rise of foreclosures associated with the, with the recession has brought a number of things to light about this little practice, which was first identified back in the 90s, back in the late 90s at some big banks. First of all, the title trail of ownership is increasingly complex and at times difficult to ascertain. Second of all, mortgage companies and now a huge host of associated intermediary services, much like these subcontractors that do these reports for the oil companies, uh, have cut corners to deal with the uptick of borrowers and arrears 
and with subsequent foreclosures, with pressure of, of uh, increasing numbers of foreclosures. Most of these companies now, mortgage companies and these uh, affiliated concerns, now have whole departments uh, created to do nothing but process documents. I think their, their organizational guide is profit. <laughs> Third, many of these departments have approached the foreclosure process in the industrial mode of production. They emphasize the speed and efficiencies of signing over the accuracy of the actual review of the documentation associated uh, either with these arrears notices or with the foreclosure notices. A mid 20th century clerk, for example, confronted with the complexity of contemporary mortgage transfers across multiple sales, as well as the complexity of, of, of uh, payments on the part of the debtor. Um, a mid-20th century clerk might have taken hours, if not indeed days, to verify that the, record, that the record was in order and foreclosure was appropriate, sufficient to have the, whole process, have the whole thing notarized and then the company would take it to court to evict and then foreclose. In 2008, the, the analogous clerk might have signed off on dozens of such cases in a single day. And many of them signed off with a squiggle that is unrecognizable. It makes your doctor's prescription signature look legible. The corporations involved at the outset, um, initially, I think the big news hit uh, uh, Ally Financial, but uh, well, within uh, mere weeks, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and One West Bank, uh, as well as others, were all implicated in this robo-signing. Uh, this process of hundreds of these things being done without one eye touching the records that they were supposedly verifying. Insofar as robo-signing affirms what is not the case, it establishes structural lies in the legal record, the effect of which are to underwrite foreclosure procedures and evictions. Here's, I'm just going to say a couple more things about this before I move on. Litigation on robo-signing continues, as I said, and it's not clear yet quite how the practice will come out at the end. Interestingly, one defense of the practice apparently stresses the, the mitigating condition of technological change. Much of property procedures in the U.S. apparently comes, in, in many U.S. states, comes from the common law. So my imaginary 20th century clerk having to deal with all of this and taking a day or two to do it, uh, comes from uh, common law procedures and, and what is expected to be attested to with particular <coughs> documents. As the defense goes, the uh, technological speed and complexity of the mortgage market has simply outstripped the clerical practices of traditional foreclosure procedures. As a consequence, or so the argument goes, what needs to change is the common law rules and procedures that under current conditions essentially necessitate what looks like fraud. Not clear in the end how that defense will go. Last, derivatives. Um, I take what little I know about derivatives from um, someone who I don't know uh, I don't know of anyone I trust more. Um, <coughs> than Warren Buffett. In the, um, so I'm actually just going to read to you a little bit of his, a very little bit, I promise, of his 2002, and I think and this is six years before the, 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 uh, the, um, <laughs> the, um, before the, the fan became soiled. <laughs> This is, a, I'm reading from the Berkshire Hathaway report, his, uh, his uh, the 2002 annual report. It has a very small but very interesting section on derivatives uh, in pages uh, 13 through uh, 15. This too is also on the web. Uh, he explains derivatives as follows. Uh, These instruments call for money to change hands at some, does everybody here understand derivatives? <laughs> One, two, okay. So if Buffett's wrong, will you let us know? <laughs> Essentially, these instruments call for money to change hands at some future date with the amount to be determined by one or more reference items, such as interest rates, stock prices, or currency value. If, for example, you are either long or short on an S&P uh, standard course 500 futures contract, 
you are a party to a very simple derivatives transaction with your gain or loss derived from movements in the index. Derivative contracts are of varying duration, 20 or more years they can run, um, and their value is often tied to several variables. Unless derivative contracts are collateralized or guaranteed, their ultimate value also depends on the creditworthiness of the counterparties to them. In the meantime, though, before a contract is settled, the counterparties record, record profits and losses, record profits and losses, often huge in amount, in their current earnings statements without so much as a penny ever changing hands. He has a much longer description of this and why he would like Berkshire Hathaway to get out of derivatives as soon as they can. Um, but he does say one thing that is very interesting for our purposes, and that is actually he says two things. The first is, the range of derivative contracts is limited only by the imagination of man. He gives examples of Enron and a few others. This question of what is the status of risk with regard to the question of a lie, we tend to think of the traditional lie as something that can only be told with regard to what is or what has been. How can you possibly lie about the future? This would be a fair criticism, I think, of what I'm trying to say. Since you can't know the future, you can't lie about it. But this is exactly why I think the documentation and records for these kinds of financial practices can be understood as structural lies. That is, they are the factual documentary record of that which certain people promised to do in the future, and the factual truth of that promise is all that matters. Whether they're right about the future or not is irrelevant. The question is how these kinds of instruments become, it's, I would, if I had a metaphor, it would be like the marbling in a fine steak, where they begin to take up a certain proportion of the entire structure of the economy as hedge fund after hedge fund after hedge fund after hedge fund gets involved in the sort of wish fulfillment exercises of economic expansion. As Buffett uh, says at the very end, speaking of his, of his own company and his uh, co-chair, uh, he says that um, uh, for the sake of their owners, creditors, policyholders, and employees, um, they have grave doubts about derivatives. He says, we try to be alert to any sort of mega catastrophic risk, risk and that posture may make us unduly apprehensive about burgeoning quantities of long-term derivatives. This is 2002, remember. In our view, however, derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction, carrying dangers that, while now latent, are potentially lethal. So that's my third example of a structural lie. That is, a non-fact that is taken to be true, that provides the basis for the actions of others, the consequences of which are only known long down the line as the public begins to trust, or as other institutions themselves in turn trust in the forms of uh, exchange and communication that have been generated uh, by these institutions. So my last observation, um, well, what the heck does all this have to do with politics? <clears throat> this is where the Arendtian category of the world, I think, bears serious consideration. Not because to know the world is to have a pathway into politics, but rather because politics depends upon a common world. And to the extent that, like the marbling in a good piece of steak, our world is fissured by the institutional residues of structural lives, the very possibility of politics is undermined. That would be my first observation. My second, and with this I'll close, it has always been the case for as long as I remember since I started being educated 
which I think was about 1955. Uh, I remember kindergarten. I didn't learn this in kindergarten, but I learned it soon afterwards. That, um, that there's a difference between politics and administration. This is, this is, I think, one of the reasons why you find so little in a rent about bureaucracy, the rule of nobody, um, except for a couple of very clear places. Uh, one, uh, in the origins of totalitarianism and in some of the other uh, short essays where the uh, totalitarian reorganization of the past, uh, the uh, erasure of Trotsky from the historical record, uh, becomes uh, uh, significant. Um, the second, actually, I think, uh, that, that bears uh, more attention in this context than it certainly has gotten uh, is uh, the argument in uh, uh, the, the, the essay on imperialism in the origins of totalitarianism, where she links the development of, of scientific racism and ideological racism in the 19th century uh, with imperialism and with the, um, uh, with the ways in which those systems of ideas um, overtake bureaucracy as a way of managing colonial than imperial uh, territories. So uh, in this respect, the structural law uh, perhaps, I think, may be thought in terms of two, uh, two kinds. And those two kinds would follow uh, Arendt's distinction between uh, factual truth and rational truth.